I was trying to think of a way to, to bring this conversation to life and, and how, we would, how we would approach this. And the first thing I thought is, well, this is going to be after lunch. It's the last panel of the day. Um, I have to do something fun. But somebody did the um, coloring and the mask making and the superheroes and the Play-Doh and the dancing. And so um, I'm stuck with nothing except um, <laughs> I do want to know who's out here amongst the, the throngs of you that are left. Um, how many of you here are, are from the education sector? And this will give our panel an idea of who's here as well. So education. Um, government? No government? Oh, one government. OK. Um, sir, uh, art service providers? Anybody? One in the back. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, corporate sector? These guys are too. OK. Um, how many of you don't know why you're here and thought you were at Comic-Con? <laughs> <laughs> that explains the fuzzy slippers on that guy over there. Um, so yesterday, I had this conversation with a parent. Um, and it was very fortuitous, because I, I, I thought, oh my god, I can use this tomorrow. This uh, parent has a student, a young son, who's going into middle school next year. And he's trying to find a school with visual arts programming. And he can't find one. He's very frustrated. Um, so he came to me and he said, you know, I can't find one. There's all these schools that have music and drama and dance. And what kind of job is he going to get with that? He can get a job with visual arts. And I thought to myself, well, now this is kind of cool. We're, we're not only talking about, you know, sort of we've moved past getting arts in school. And now we're fighting about what kind of arts are in school. So, um, but I reminded him that you know, we, we teach math in school, but we don't expect all of the students to become mathematicians. And it's the same with the arts. We don't, you know, we don't teach the arts and infuse the arts because we want everybody to be a musician or a dancer. And quite frankly, for, for every parent like that who has a student in the visual arts, there's probably a parent out there complaining that their kid can't get music education because they're too busy teaching visual arts. So the arts are important. We know that. Not only do we know it, but corporate America knows that. CEOs were surveyed a number of years ago. And this sort of what led um, our interest in arts education when I was at the Boeing company. And CEOs said that they, the thing that they wanted to find in their workforce of the future the most was creativity. And all the things that come with it, communication, cooperation, collaboration. So we have this level of CEOs that understand the importance. And we have these amazing superheroes and these superheroes out here who understand it as well. But I think there's also sort of this level of maybe upper or middle management, sub-C level, that doesn't get it, and that it's constant education for them. And there's also hundreds, if not thousands, of companies and businesses, small, successful businesses out there, technology companies, particularly in, the, in California, that rely on the types of skills that we're talking about, but don't do anything to help the process, that don't do anything to help the job pipeline. So how do we talk to them about it? And so that's what I'm hoping that we can kind of get from this conversation, not necessarily how to talk to them, but what happened at Boeing? What happened at S Southern California, Southern San Diego Gas and Electric? Yes. What happened at JPL? How did those conversations happen? And how do we then extrapolate those to conversations with others? So we have Vanessa Pareda from the Boeing Company. Please give a round of applause. Pedro Villegas from San Diego Gas and Electric. And our first presenter um, is from JPL. And it's Shari Asman. So Shari, you want to take it away? Thank you. As um, Jim said, I'm Shari Asplund. I manage education and communications for two programs of NASA missions that are exploring the solar system, from Mercury to Pluto and points in between. And I love using the arts to help engage students and the public in our space investigations. Today I'm going to talk about creative mission design, science visualized through art, and STEAM in action. 
These are some of the missions I've been fortunate to work with over the past 16 years. How would you land the first rover on the surface of Mars? Or send an impactor into the surface of a speeding comet? Or collect samples of comet dust and return them back to Earth? Who would have the audacity to think they could fly a spacecraft the size of a piano three billion miles all the way out to tiny Pluto? The New Horizons spacecraft will be getting there in July after nine years of flight. Have you ever wondered how spacecraft get made? How they go from science questions to engineering fantasy and become an actual flying machine? I don't think most people appreciate the tremendous complexity of these engineering marvels. But for the past five years, JPL has had visual strategists who merge design thinking with rocket science. So how would you plan a journey to Mars? Welcome to left field, where creative ideas grow and where space mission ideas are born. Left field is a flexible space that looks like a preschool with whiteboards. It's packed with toys, sticky pads, bins with Legos, pipe cleaners, and other crafty items all to help scientists brainstorm radical ways of exploring space. The ideas literally come out of left field. Three phrases are written on the walls in this room. Encourage wild ideas, defer judgment, and build on the ideas of others. It's the napkin sketch stage. All the different disciplines come together. Compelling science ideas become captivating stories. How can we get into the caves on Mars? A grand scheme may be lurking in a box of tinker toys. Led by Dan Goods, JPL has NASA's first creative studio to visualize science through art. A team of six design earthlings work to transform complex concepts into meaningful stories that can be universally understood. They bring emotion and context to our robots and spacecraft and planetary objects through exhibits, data visualization, and interactive installations. Their projects are so much fun that people don't realize they're learning anything. This is called the Pulse. NASA's Deep Space Network consists of three insanely powerful, huge antenna that monitor and track all spacecraft beyond low Earth orbit. It's how NASA sends navigation commands to all the spacecraft, along with software updates, and it's how all the data and the gorgeous pictures that you see from space come back to Earth. The Pulse is a sculpture that uses LED lights to show in real time how much information is being sent and received from 22 space missions. More activity means more light, means more data is transmitted. This is a sculpture in one of the buildings at, at JPL. So there you go. I'm expecting Captain Kirk to kind of <laughs> I know. Up there. It looks like that, huh? Like, and you know, and who would think to take that data, which is just you know the X's and the O's coming back from space, and to turn it into something that really is a beautiful thing to see in person? A mission called Kepler is a space telescope looking for Earth-sized planets that orbit other stars. This is extremely difficult because stars are billions of times bigger and brighter than the planets they're looking for. Kepler has actually discovered more than 5,000 possible planets out there. The hidden light investigates the concept of seeing what is unseen. People walk in front of the light, and their shadow reveals a hidden movie projected on the wall. Participants learn that trying to find planets around other stars is like trying to detect a firefly in front of a spotlight in New York City from Los Angeles. Metamorphosis is a glowing 12-foot-long sculpture shrouded in fine mist. It's a representation of a comet that is the target of the Rosetta mission, the first ever to make a soft landing on a comet and study its chemical composition. The craggy surface and the craters that you see on Metamorphosis were pounded in by the artists. They call it form by force. The sculpture aims to spark curiosity about comets and how they behave. Metamorphosis evokes the glow in the atmosphere of comets, which produce light, gas, and dust when heated by the sun. It's also displayed near water to represent the belief that water may have been brought to our Earth millions of years ago by comets. If one grain of sand represented an entire galaxy, 
You would need six rooms full of sand to contain all the galaxies in the known universe. In this installation, a single grain of sand represents our Milky Way galaxy. A tiny hole drilled into it represents where scientists have found thousands of planets. The installation includes an enormous amount of sand, so visitors can imagine running their fingers through billions of galaxies, each containing hundreds of billions of stars. It's kind of mind-blowing. And this, of course, is that grain of sand magnified many times. The gas giant planet Jupiter has enormous lightning storms. A NASA mission called Juno will give us the closest look yet at the striking planet that has dozens of moons. When people walk into the room with this installation, they're greeted by the sound of rumbling thunder and crackling lightning, yet they see only a large, dense, glowing cloud. The cloud hides infrared cameras, which are invisible to the naked eye, but visible to many cell phone cameras. When visitors grab one of the cell phones that are part of the installation, the flashes deep within the clouds are revealed on the phone, just as Juno's special detectors will peer through the clouds of Jupiter and reveal its hidden secrets. Art and the Cosmic Connection is an innovative STEAM program. Now we're back onto STEAM in Action, developed by two of my wonderful collaborators, Monica and Tyler Aiello, who had a booth, their Eureka's booth out there today. They empower students and learning through creative scientific inquiry. In Art and the Cosmic Connection, students become artist explorers as they investigate the mysterious worlds of our solar system using the elements of art, line, shape, value, texture, and color to help uncover, uncover geologic stories of our celestial neighbors. Students of all ages begin to understand and interpret NASA images of the planets, moons, and the small bodies, and they create their own beautiful artwork. I'm now working with the ILOs on a really fun new Mission Makers project that we're looking forward to being a really new maker activity. And then Space School Musical, Kelly McQuinn from Kid Tribe and I collaborated to introduce kids to the solar system in a very fun and innovative way that makes kids laugh, move, and remember what they've learned. Over our year-long evaluation showed great success in increasing student interest in science topics and even science careers. Thousands of kids have performed the musical all over the country over the last four years. Both of those activities can be downloaded for free from our website, discovery.nasa.gov. And if we have time, I had a video to roll. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.
Thank you, Sherry. I, that's certainly not something you would necessarily associate with JPL, which is, wow. I think, fantastic. That's what's great about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the stuff you have going on up there in just a minute. But Pedro, I've tell us what you guys are doing. Well, I've got nothing on that, to be quite <laughs> honest. Uh, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't do a lot of dancing at SDG&E. Uh, <laughs> oh, do you really? There's my colleague Amanda, by the way, that, that uh, she'll appreciate this because uh, she, uh, she works at, a, at our skills unit, which is right next to uh, Mission Control. So if you're driving north on the 805 and you get to the 8, if you look to the right, there's a building there with a whole bunch of poles and wires and, and stuff coming out of it. And that's where we, we, uh, we run the grid from for all of our customers in San Diego County and, and South Orange County. And I'll, I'll explain in a minute why that's important. I wanted to give you sort of a window into our company and why in particular uh, STEAM is important to, to us. And so I'm gonna show you some slides and you might see one thing and I'm gonna give you the Rorschach of what we see when we see that slide. And these, these slides are slides that come from our partners and some of, some of our partners here in the room today. Um, in particular, I want, want, want to sort of start out with what STG&E is doing. Um, we're interested in STEAM because we know what we need to do to accomplish the state's environmental goals, right? Back uh, in 2006, uh, Assembly Bill 32 was signed into law. And when it was signed into law, everyone around the table knew, and we, by the way, were the first utility to sign on to it, uh, and we've, we'd already done a lot of work to uh, think through sort of how we might accomplish those goals. Uh, we knew that we didn't have, we couldn't get there to those goals from where we were without a lot of innovation, without a lot of creativity, right? And so what we did is we actually developed a business model for our company around climate solutions, around Assembly Bill 32 to try to meet those goals. And what, is it, what does that mean? That means that we knew that if we were gonna make it to 33% renewables, right, of all the power that we deliver to our customers by 2020, that we were gonna to need to figure out better ways of building our infrastructure to be able to accommodate a power source, renewables, that kind of comes and goes with the wind, comes and goes with, 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 uh, with the sun, right? Um, and by the way, we're at 32% today, five years ahead of the deadline, and that's a really good thing that you should all be proud of in this room. And we're 0% coal as well. Uh, so, so when you think about it from that perspective, that's one thing, right? But we knew that we needed to build a grid that would be able to enable a lot of new technology. And so today we have a grid that supports 50,000, almost 50,000 solar rooftop installations, right? And that's a really big deal. Uh, we have a grid that supports almost 14,000 electric vehicles. And that's a really big deal. And when you think about the, you know, that battery in each one of those vehicles and what you can use it for, maybe at the peak times of the day in the future, that's, that's a really important thing. Um, we knew that we had to build a system that would adapt to climate change. We didn't used to have Santa Ana winds in February and March. We have Santa Ana winds in February and March. So what did we build, which is right next to, to, to Amanda's shop? We built a weather station, and we actually owned a third largest weather station in the United States, privately owned a weather station in the United States. And now we know three, four days in advance when the Santa Ana winds are coming, and we know to uh, which canyon they're gonna come down and the moisture levels there and all that type of thing. And we can actually prepare better for those type of things. And not just in terms of our infrastructure, but also everyone in, in the county can prepare for those Santa Ana winds. So, so what do you have to do to get there, right? And all these innovations, first of all, they're all teaching moments. And we got a lot of teaching moments in our, in our company. And so the first thing that we do is we actually share those teaching moments in the community. So this is a slide here in Oceanside down the street um, of uh, April Bull Duke. Uh, she's the adult in the group, in case you were wondering. Uh, and she uh, is one of our clean transportation managers. And she's there with 50 of her brand new friends, girls, that we're trying to expose to science, technology, and engineering, and math. And I'll get to the A in a minute. I'm not leaving the A out. Don't, don't, don't think that. Uh, and she's explained to them what it means to be zero emissions how a battery works, right? What's, what's special about electric vehicles? 
you know, how long it takes to charge them, and the types of things, all the changes that comes when you decide to, to drive one of these in your daily uh, behavioral habits, right? So this and our weather station and a lot of other things, we, we really make a big effort uh, through our nonprofit partners to bring kids into our world and the world of creativity and innovation and stimulate a lot of inspiration. This is uh, uh, another, we have a lot of mentoring that we do and we actually have a lot of uh, women engineers in our company and we put together a conference or two a year where we invite in uh, girls that are interested in, in, in science. And we put this together and we put it, we put it, um, we put it on for them and, and they get to talk directly to our engineers and they learn about all the things, all the teaching moments in our, in our company as well. Um, this is from the Ocean Discovery Institute. So one thing that we do is, you know, we take everything that we do and we put it out in the community and we invite people in to, to visit with us as well. The Ocean Discovery Institute, though, is a good example of what we do to support uh, groups, nonprofit groups that serve lots of schools, right? And they actually go into the schools and they help uh, uh, teach the difference between renewables and non-renewables, right, through, through some uh, hands-on uh, experiential learning. But it's even more than that because if you understand the communities that they are specializing in, uh, these are underserved, extremely diverse communities. And we know as a utility that serves everybody that in the future, our ranks have to look like the communities we serve if we're gonna be effective. And they help us do that to actually you know, create that new generation of leaders and engineers and scientists that we need to be successful in the future. Um, this slide's kind of, kind of neat, and, and I put it in here for a particular reason. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the Elementary uh, Institute of Science. Uh, yeah, right here, that's right. Those guys are rock stars. And on the left-hand side, you have the uh, National Society of, of Black Engineers, the SEEK cap that we put on here. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's really cool. Um, here's a couple of, um, and so here's the Rorschach thing, right? Uh, at the end of, uh, two years ago, at the end of, of, their, of their summer camp, they had the kids put together these little cars, these little solar cars, right? So here's your panel, here's your wires, you gotta make it up, you have to, you have to put together these cars. And typically, the one that can go straight one, Right, and the other ones will go. Eee! Didn't quite make it to the, to the finish line, but that's okay. That's not the point. The kids came up with a lot of different ways to put their car together. Right, that's the creativity and innovation part. That's the arts. They put the A. Those kids themselves put the A. Yeah, some cars you know kind of look this way and this way and somewhere. You know, it, it was very very creative. But that's that's the type of, of thing that you have to stimulate in kids because we don't really we know how to build a, a mouse trap, right? We need to blow up the mousetrap and actually make it obsolete maybe and make something else different. That's kind of the next generation of what we need. That's, what, that's how we think in the energy industry to be able to do these type of things. Um, I put this in here too because now we're getting into the, into the realm of the arts, the STEM, right? So the top one is the, uh, is, is the Real Voices program, which is at uh, the Pacific Arts Movement, right? They take uh, uh, digital arts, right? And they teach kids how to make films. But it's more than that. They teach them how to story tell. And they teach you how to get a lot of people together around a table and figure out how to run a project, how to make a film. And so now you're not just scientifically competent. You're actually working with other people, and you're creating something new. And then on the bottom, um, you'll see the, uh, the Pacific Arts Movement are the ones on the bottom, and the top is, is the Media Arts Center. We, we actually live in a community where we have really amazing science. I mean, just amazing science. Uh, this is from the Hub Sea World uh, uh, folks that, that you know, do extraordinary marine science. Um, and they open, we fund a program with them to go into a number of schools called the Sea Bass in the Classroom Project. And it teaches a lot about replenishing the ocean, about sustainability, right? And not just once you get past the, just the biology that you have to know about, about, uh, about sea bass, it's really about being, knowing about sustainability and how to enhance that through science. And this is the Jonas Salk Institute. People forget that the Jonas Salk Institute is here in our community. And I gotta tell you, this guy on the left-hand side, he's actually a Turkish guy that grew up in, in, uh, in Germany and he'd just gotten here three weeks, three weeks ago from today. And in speaking to him, he's just one of like 200 people that have the same sort of story from all kind of you know, different places in the world. And being able to give children this kind of access to the places where they're doing the molecular and the biological science, 
to actually you know, come up with all the cures for everything we can think of right now. That's really an amazing resource that you're not gonna probably get anywhere else. I mean, but every community has brains like this, right? And being able to connect them to the community, that's what we do. We, we fund a lot of programs to be able to get this type of experience in, into, into kids' minds and get them actually figuring out how to, how if this guy doesn't get to the cure, they will, right? And so that, that, that's something that we do as well. And then we have some other partners in the room as well from, from the Aja project and the like. And, and, so, and so you've got, you've got a lot of really good examples in our communities where we take, uh, where we know that it's not enough just to teach the photographic arts and you know, how, how light works, you know, and, and, and that's, 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 that's probably not enough. But when you see the kids, that, the, and these are kids from war-torn countries, a lot of them that actually you know, they, they, they use photography to learn, to uh, get a hold of you know, their, their, their circumstance and their, and their particular neighbors, in this case, in City Heights. Uh, but when you think about sort of their mastery of science and the comfort that gives them and the social good that that pro provides them, and then the types of innovation and creativity that they, from their own experience, they leverage it, they turn it into a positive, and they do amazing things. And if you've never been to that gallery down in City Heights, I, I, I encourage you to do so because you, you see things you won't see anywhere else. So that's why, that's how we see STEM, that's our Rorschach test. And those types of creative and innovation experiences are the type of things that, that, that we particularly like to support and that uh, we think will help, in the end, make an energy company more than just an energy company, actually make it sort of a people company, an innovation and creativity company. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. And uh, last but not least, Vanessa. Thank you. So I'm actually going to begin today with a short video. And the reason why I chose this video is not because it showcases our work in the community, but it really showcases our environmental innovation and how we use that to meet our customers' demands. With birds flying in formation, so they're able to fly much further without getting tired. In, in our case, we're trying to reduce fuel burn. And what we're trying to do is really take that inspiration and make it realizable for aircraft. So we've seen from flight tests, we've been able to get anywhere from five to 10% reduction in fuel burn. That's enabled by the software that we've built in, and we actually have extra situational awareness of where the lead aircraft is, what the winds is experiencing, so that helps us predict the wake. Now this is uh, very substantial if you think about the investment we've put into products like uh, the 87 or the 47-8 or, or the next product. They're talking 20, 25 percent, and here we're able to get half that with the uh, software change. The lead aircraft generates lift. And that action of generating lift is what creates those vortices. And that's what you see when you look up and you see the control, you see those nice ribbons sometimes form. You look at your drain as it drains out, you actually see a little ribbon that forms up. That's a vortex. Yeah, but it's now coming off the wingtip. We then position a trail aircraft close to that wake, which is energy lost when it was generating the lift. And now we let the trail aircraft recapture some of that energy. Actually, our pilots refer to it as Surfing. In fact, the acronym for the program is Surfing Aircraft Vortices for Energy. Save. For the Air Force, uh, they're very interested in this for military transports. They've spent a lot of time doing fuel efficiency initiatives, and there's nothing out there that's got this kind of potential reduction. But yeah, I look for inspiration in nature, so amongst the birds and the insects. Um, but there's definitely, I think, a lot out there. That's a challenge to me. You know, what is a bird doing, and, and how can we take advantage of that? So the reason why I chose this video um, was not because I wanted to highlight our great achievements in, in green innovation. Um, but before I saw this, if somebody asked me, what are you doing in terms of fuel efficiency, I said, you know, we're building planes out of composites, we're looking at biofuels. I never would have thought of saying, we look at inspiration in nature and in the world around us. And I think that's what, you know, all of this is about STEAM, our thinking creatively, is we need our engineers and the next generation of engineers and our students to think outside of the box, to you know, go outside of their workspace, take a moment, think creatively, have the courage to say, I have an idea. Can we study birds some more? I mean, that kind of sounds like a silly concept if you think about it. Say, I think that 
if we were to save energy, it would be just by studying birds and the way they fly. I mean, just to have the courage to say that and for other people to be on board and for your manager to say, okay, run with it. If you fail, you fail. But if not, you know, we might succeed and achieve something that's gonna meet our customers' needs. Uh, Jim had mentioned the Dreamliner. Uh, so I, I assume how many people have actually flown on a plane? I'm assuming the majority of you all have. How many of you have strategically tried to fit all of your clothes, limit yourself to one pair of shoes, and try to do it on a carry-on so that you don't have to check in your luggage, right? But yet, once you get to the gate, you find out you still have to check it in because there's no space, right? Uh, and how many of you have been delayed for a flight because of maintenance issues? So these are all issues that we as a, as a company also have to face. We have to answer these um, to meet our customer because the airlines are going to come back to us and say, you know, this is what we need. We need fuel efficiency. We need um, to make more money off of these flights. How can we do that? Uh, so if you look actually at the Dreamliner, some of the few things that we've done is, you know, how many times do you go also on the plane and for those tall men, you kind of have to like, there's no space. Well, if you look at the older models of planes, the, the ceiling for the passengers is up here, but really the plane kind of curves around like this. So the Dreamliner, let's start using that space. And it's now opened up, and now people can walk. You have a better feeling while you're in the plane. You don't feel as claustrophobic. Um, and also, it allows us more room for the overhead compartment. Now more luggage, everyone's happier. So these are the types of things that we need as a company to be able to solve. Um, and continue to be innovative because if we don't, our competitor will. Um, and so if we're gonna achieve another 100 years of success because in 2016 will be our 100 year anniversary, we know that we need to be on top of all of this. We need to continuously be creative and innovative with all of our products and the way we handle those products. So, so you know, those overhead bins on the 767 are horrible. And I think, you know, two generations of planes later, it has evolved into something that actually works for people when they're traveling. Um, so Shari, you, you kind of briefly talked about your visual strategist. So what, what is a visual strategist and how did JPL come up with this? I don't know where that title okay. came from. But the visual strategist is a guy named Dan Goods who graduated from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena about 10 years ago. And during his time at, at Art Center, he worked on a project with Caltech scientists. At JPL, we are Caltech employees. So at some point, he was able to take a tour of the Jet Propulsion Lab and actually meet our director. I don't think most tours get to uh, meet the director. But Dan recalls that he had about two seconds to sell himself. And when he met the director, he said, wouldn't it be cool if artists could help you explore space? And to his credit, apparently our director thought, hmm, that might not be a bad idea, and took it to the executive council, who said, well, we're a little skeptical about this idea, but we'll give you six months. And Dan's initial title was Artist in Residence, and I started hearing about him right away. This was 10 years ago, and just the ideas that he brings to the place, both in helping design space missions and in these installations that I show it, and in so many other ways. It's been incredible. So they said, this is working for us. And he now has this team of six people. There are animators, graphic designers, people with a complete design background that bring that element that was never there before. Mm -hmm. I mean, in years past, engineers and scientists barely spoke to each other. Right. And now they're not only speaking to each other, but they've got someone facilitating it and helping them be more creative. Yeah. So Dan has really changed the world at JPL, and it's the only NASA center that has that right now. Wow. So hopefully at some point the others, the others will kind will. of see the light. And how long has he been there? He's been there for 10 years For already. 10 years. Wow, that's amazing. And that you talked about communication and how important that is. And right, the skills communication that with bring. the public and students. Um, the space exploration business ba is based on funding that we have to compete for. Um, and Congress doesn't want to fund things that the public isn't happy about. So in order to reach the public better and to bring them these installations and other ways of engaging them and helping them learn, even when they don't want to be learning, sneaking in the learning, um, hopefully that will gender more public support, which will you know, allow more, um, more and more space explorations to happen and getting kids more engaged so that more kids will be interested in going into the science and on all the STEM mm -hmm. elements. You know, you know, when you think about like the Renaissance period 
and all the amazing advances, the architecture. It was all driven by artists. Right. Um, you know, arts and science are, go hand in hand, and so it's great to see yeah, all of this it happening. It was at during the Renaissance, and then it kind of disappeared, and mm -hmm. thankfully it's coming back again. Yeah, and awesome. so many people realize the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. So Pedro, mm -hmm. put you on the spotlight now. So within the culture of San Diego Gas and Electric, how do you manage to, to bring these programs into the corporate culture and, and sell your ideas on how to engage the community in the ways that you are with this, with the programs that you're supporting? Yeah, we kind of have a, a, a mantra in, in the department I work in, uh, community, community relations, and that is, we try to bring the community into the company and take the company out to the community and do those simultaneously, right? Mm -hmm. So I was at, a, I was at Reality Changers a, a few, few weeks ago. It's a local nonprofit that helps kids get into college, basically. First generation in a neighborhood that's highly underserved, very uh, diverse. Um, and a young man came up to me, and he's, he's uh, 13 years old. He says, I kind of think I might like engineering but I have no idea where to get started. Um, and I don't think I've ever met an engineer. I can fix that. <laughs> so we fixed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, one of our engineers met with him, gave him a call first, you know, and, and, uh, and talked to him a little bit about sort of what he did, and, and they actually met. And so these are the type of things that, that we can do, and they seem they seemed simple, they seem very kind of mundane, but they are transformational for a lot of children. Mm -hmm. um, now, how do we get the arts involved into that too? Um, you know, I think we, we, we figured out how to do the science, technology, engineering, and math. But we know, we, we live in a very different world than a utility 20 or 30 years ago did, right? We have a ton of data, behavioral data, now through the smart meters. And how do you communicate to your customers in a different way to get that data in front of them in ways that you can actually understand easily and act on uh, so that behaviorally you're changing your behavior so you can save some money on your bill, so you can use less energy, improve the environment, those type of things. Um, those are all sort of uh, things that are very artistic. I mean, you need to be able to, to, to render things digitally and artistically in a way that, that a customer will grasp. It's the beauty of Apple. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, Apple didn't just become, you know, create a great phone that everybody has in their pocket, well, almost everybody, um, because, because they built an amazing piece of engineering. They became Apple because they created a great piece of engineering that was designed in a way that was just cool, right? That just kind of, we just, it was like drinking water. We just, folks just picked it up, it's easy. You know, the, the curves on it, the apps on it. I mean, it was, so, and, and that's, all, that's all the creative side. You know, I think uh, if you're left to just sort of, you know, the technical side um, and, and being, being uh, um, proficient in it, you may not actually get to that, that, that competitive edge that the arts give you. And so we try to do that in our customer communications, you know, and how we present data and, and the tools that we present to our customers. Um, and then we do some other things that probably kind of seem a little out of the, out of the, out of the box, too. And, and, and in, in particular, uh, the... Uh, you know, you think about how we design our system, right? Um, we can design it a lot of different ways, right? But we do engage the community. We ask the community, well, you know, we can do it this way, we can do it this way, or do you have a better idea for a third way? You know, we, we invite folks into the company to, you know, a problem we're trying to solve or something that we're trying to build or whatever it might be, and we, and we, invite, we, we invite them into the problem, we, 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 uh, we present the problem, explain sort of how we went through uh, with a solution that we might think, or a couple of solutions we might think will work, and then we'll get input and we'll, we'll integrate that input into those solutions or come up with a third one that we may not have thought of, whatever it might be. That's how we get good ideas, and, and a lot of those people that come to the table, they may not be technical people. They may be an artist, you know, they may be a liberal arts major or, you know, a, a great books guy, you know, from you know a small liberal arts college somewhere. I mean, and, and that's where you really get well-rounded out products, policies, strategies. That's how you deliver better service to people. Mm -hmm. Are you working with any of your suppliers with any of this, or have you approached them? Uh, yeah, actually, we do. Uh, we try to be very integrated with with our suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's and I'll give you a good example. It doesn't actually have to do with 
esteem necessarily, but, but on, in the environmental area. It's not enough for us just to be you know, conscious of our water use, uh, conscious of, of, our, of, of our energy use and, and those type of, and, and in, our, in our operations. That's not enough. Uh, we actually extend that to our suppliers. And we encourage them also to, to also find new and better environmental ways of, of providing service to us. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing when you think about creativity and innovation. If we have a supplier that's been giving us the same product you know, for three, four, five, six years, it kind of light goes off. Why aren't they bringing us a better way to do this? Mm -hmm. Right? Because the world changes, and it changes pretty quickly. And there's a lot of people out there with a lot of great ideas. And, and the chances are that you know, folks will progress. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to see that, that progress. That's awesome. And I think that's one of the ways that businesses can help move STEAM and STEM along is to really engage the, their, the people that they're working with, the businesses and, and companies that they work with, and create you know, an industry culture, not just a, a corporate culture. That's right. So Vanessa, I know that at Boeing, you guys approach STEAM and STEM a little bit differently in, in, in that you don't necessarily support um, the programs that like we've seen with, with Pedro and the, the, the student programs, but really are more interested in supporting teachers and educators and getting them skills, as well as advocacy mm -hmm. um, for arts education. So can you, you talk a little bit about that? Oh, of course. So also, um, earlier, Jim mentioned that he used to work with Boeing and, and quoted. So Jim used to be my boss. Um, so if he chimes in at any point, or if I look at him and say, Jim, how would you have answered that question? Now you know why. <laughs> um, but, I don't uh, work there anymore. <laughs> you do. And, and Jim has also been there. It's really when uh, the California strategy for our arts giving was really developed. Um, we focus in two areas, teacher development and arts advocacy. Um, one of the reasons why, too, is because you know, we are primarily based in Los Angeles and Orange County. And we have a very limited budget as well. Um, and we want to make as much of possible as impact, or as much of an impact as possible, given the resources that we have. Uh, so when it came to arts education, we decided to focus on teacher development. Because if you have one teacher who understands and can incorporate arts through the classroom, we're going to touch more children over time. Um, and hopefully that one teacher can also be an advocate within her, her own school as well and teach other teachers or engage them and encourage them to also um, obtain that professional development. The other piece is arts advocacy. And I, I think many of you in the room here understand the need for arts advocacy. Um, you know, arts is supposed to be in the classroom and supposed to be um, in every school, but it's not. And so we need to ensure that um, it is. And so we put a, a lot of money towards that um, and towards that effort and that fight. And I think there's lots of innovative ways that we also support that more than financially. I, I know I think it was Suzette from Carlsbad Unified that mentioned, you know, industry needs to get on board and help us in other ways. And I wanted to raise my hand and say, wait, we have been. <laughs> or, you know, I think there, there's been ways. Um, several of those ways is, for example, uh, last month with Arts OC, we hosted uh, superintendents from throughout Orange County, the VAPA leaders and other uh, arts instructors at our Seal Beach facility to hear from one of our executives as to why innovation and creativity is important to us and why the work that they do every day in support of the arts is very essential to business and to also ensure that the success of that student, of every student in their school, is, is, is possible and arts education is going to help that. Um, and, and so I think that was one way, you know, inspire others. Um, and also, you know, we also are up in Sacramento. We're working with our locally elected officials quite a bit. Obviously, it's, it's with a specific Boeing purpose. But if we know what an arts organization's agenda is, who their top um, you know, legislators are that they need to target and give that messaging to, if they relay that information to us, when we're in Sacramento the next time or meeting with this elected official, we can also put that plug in and say, you know, this is also why we support the arts. And the one thing that I've noticed, too, is that when we meet with these elected officials or these uh, school boards and we say, Bowen is here because of the arts, they actually start listening. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not that angry parent. We're not the, you know, um, you know that, that, the same voice. We become a different voice. And I think that, that tends to get them to kind of like stop and listen and, and see 
our point of view as well. I think it's the unusual voice that, mm -hmm. that comes through, the one that's not, that you wouldn't necessarily normally think of. Um, so real quickly, I want to get to all of you one more time, but real quickly, so Sherry, um, you have your strategist, your visual strategist and their staff, but how is the rest of the, the, the employees there engaged and, and with the arts and how do they seem to take what that visual strategist is doing and, and are inspired? Well, there have been a number of space missions and instruments. Sometimes JPL builds instruments that go on other, sometimes um, European spacecraft. And there have been many things that have been, the ideas started in that left field room. Um, the core group in there is called the A-Team. Um, and they take their concept to a certain level. And then it goes to the next group of people who actually do really refine it into a real mission. And that's called Team X. Um, so there have been a number that have come out of left field and have gone on to fly as actual missions. Um, so th I think the people are all kind of getting the idea and realizing how you want to do things differently. You want to think mm -hmm. differently. And I think it's been a real influence. And of course, there are many scientists and engineers at JPL who are musicians mm -hmm. and pursue other kinds of arts. It's, as you said, from the Renaissance days on, I mean, they kind of go together. You yeah. don't tend to think of it, like, but yeah. they do. So, and we have some other arts-based activities. There's one called Imagine Mars, where students are asked to imagine, remember, think about what their community has and how you would take the essential things that are important to you and bring them to a, building a community on Mars. Awesome. So there's a lot of engagement with that too. So we have a few other STEAM activities, as well as continually trying to get employees to kind of think a little bit differently. Okay. Did anybody have any questions or cards? real quickly? Well, you know, the, the relationship, it's, and that's just what it is. It's not a grantee-grantor mm -hmm. relationship. You know, it's not, we don't cut a check and then go away and then do it again the next year. That's not how we operate, right? What we do is we actually want, we really want to find out what your goals are, um, what you believe in, what, where you want to be three years from now, where you want to be five years from now. And every one of our partners, we share the, we share the same goals. And it's not just a check, it's, to, it's a check, it's volunteers, it's expertise, it's visibility, like plugging the, the arts or an organization when you go up to the lobby, uh, um, Sacramento. It's those type of things. And we become a stakeholder in your success. That's a partnership. And then, then you have a, you know, we, we don't practice charity. We practice philanthropy. We make philanthropic investments. We're serious about actually reaching those goals. And we want to make sure that we do everything we can to help you reach those goals. Did you have a question? No, they didn't have it before. They had this Team X that met to come up with mission formulation ideas, but not in the creative sense. So left field is new. And a woman who's a, another woman who's a graduate of Art Center is the main creative person. She's a member of the core team. And she's always there working with them to guide them along and facilitate. So that, that is new within the last about four years. So Vanessa, in one minute, can you talk just real quickly about the work that Boeing's doing with the STEM and arts people in LA County and Orange County and now San Diego? In one County? minute? <laughs> yes. This, you might have better. Um, it, I'm also just looking at Pat. So I think, you know, when we're talking about the innovative products that we, we try to build and everything, it's the same thing with our programs that we support in the community. Uh, so we really saw a need for all the arts organizations to just start collaborating um, and start communicating and work together and share those best practices and sort of just be on the same page versus you know, everybody kind of working in silos. Um, and so you know, we, kind of, we connected them a few years ago when Jim was still with Boeing. And we've been trying to continue that. Uh, and it, it, what came out of it is really just the arts and STEM collaborative um, that brings together everyone from Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego. We just met yesterday. Uh, we're definitely making some leeway. And I think you know, the best part about the, the collaborative, just really the dialogue, mm -hmm. is get people to, to talk about this and, and supporting the efforts. It's, you know, this is going on in STEM. How can we put the, the A mm -hmm. in there? And so it's everybody kind of joining the fight together mm -hmm. under one voice. I think it was trying to learn what the sectors could learn from one another. Yeah. 
that really drove that. So um, I, Vanessa had mentioned something real quickly, and I, I don't want it to get lost, that you know, arts education, we talk about it, it's all wonderful, everybody has the kumbaya moment, but arts education is guaranteed to every student in California. And the state has not done a good job of, of delivering on that promise. And so arts education is an access equity issue. It is a social justice issue. And so let that not be lost by, on anybody here that it is important. And you know, it, unfortunately, it's the kids that have the least amount of access that are the ones that are, are going to be even further behind as they try and go into the workforce. And if we want a workforce of the future, um, if we want our kids to participate that, and, and California for the first time is a, a native state, meaning we're now educating more people. We have more people born here than are coming here, so we actually have to educate our future workforce. So if we want our future edu our, our kids to participate in that workforce, if we want our regions and our state to be competitive, if we want our companies to be competitive, then we have to make sure that students not only have the science and the knowledge that science brings, but the, but the, the skills that the arts bring as well. So with that, I think we'll thank our wonderful superhero panel.